And that's my cue. Hi, everybody. Um, and thank you for joining us tonight for this evening's very special episode of The Yard. Uh, my name is Richard Bronson. I am the founder and CEO of 70 Million Jobs, which is the first national for-profit <laughs> employment platform for people with criminal records. And I'm also a uh, commissary club. And Commissary Club is new. It's the first social network for folks with records. Um, I myself served a couple of years in federal prison about 16 years ago. Um, what is the yard? Um, we try to evoke <laughs> the experience that anyone who's ever done time can relate to. Um, unless you've been locked down, which in this coronavirus environment, lots of folks have been in prison, but unless you've been locked down or unless you're in trouble and you're doing solitary confinement, every day the prison will let inmates pretty much go out, and get some fresh air for an hour, an hour and a half, something like that. And it's an opportunity to maybe get some exercise, um, you know, walk around a little bit, clear your head, um, and mostly just hang out with the people you hang out with, you know, the people who you who've become friends with you. And it's what you did yesterday and it's what you're gonna do tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. Um, and, you know, generally you're talking about things that are important sometimes, sometimes they're very unimportant. Um, sometimes you're gonna laugh and sometimes you're gonna cry. Sometimes you'll be angry, sometimes you'll be very calm, all kinds of emotions. You know what? What strings it all together? What brings it all together is that at all times you're just connecting with other human beings who are going through this experience with you. Um, normally, I have a couple of my teammates joining me on the yard, Seth Sunberg and Divine, but they're taking the night off. Um, but I'm not going to be alone. Um, I'm being joined by three really exceptional, incredible women. Uh, women that I know you will come to appreciate as you hear them speak, their intelligence, their strength, their integrity, um, and they've all done time. And they are here to share their experience as if we're all out in the yard together. Um, specifically, we have Maurice uh, Liberti, Maurice is the former CEO of a company called Pokeware, Pokeware right? Pokeware, did I get that right? Pokeware, yeah. Yes, um, it was a, techno a very, very tech uh, successful technology company that she founded, a technology company at Exchange that she founded back in 1997. So that, that's early technology for the technology world. Um, in September of 2017, she was convicted of fraud and she received a four year sentence. She was released this past April. She is now very, very active in a variety of organizations that are seeking change in a very broken criminal justice system. So welcome Maurice, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, next we have my good buddy, Shelly Winner, who um, is um, skiing in the Alps right now apparently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's a nice background you have there, Shelly. Looks cold there. Um, Shelly um, is a very prominent advocate for criminal justice reform. Uh, when she's not working at Microsoft um, and helping Microsoft uh, do all they can do with diversity, <laughs> she's delivering TEDx talks. And if you have the chance, go on YouTube and listen to her talk on TEDx. It's pretty powerful. Um, and she speaks internationally about, you know, criminal justice and diversity. And she's really just so powerful and wonderful. Um, and last but not least, we have a woman that I met last night, or two, actually uh, maybe a week ago, First, um, Nicole Coco Davis, I met her on Clubhouse. 
um, which is, for many of you may know, is a very hot <clears throat> social network app that has very interesting people um, popping in and out. Nicole um, is Coco, I'm sorry. That's, that's the name she goes by. She is the CEO and executive director of Talk To Me Foundation, as well as the Sisters of Support House, which um, she'll tell you about later, um, which exists for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women. She did 13 and a half years of federal time. And as she puts it, she's used the power of writing and advocacy to secure equality and second chances for justice impact, impacted um, people uh, and particularly for women. Um, so we're gonna get started. And what I do every time, and I know it's annoying perhaps, but humor me, I'm gonna ask everybody to please just shut their eyes for a moment or two and just take a deep breath and relax. And for those of you who are here watching and listening, if you've done time, I'd like you to, you know, and maybe it's a little painful to do it. Maybe you don't wanna do it, but just think back of those days, day after day after day that you were out in the yard and you were just hanging out and hanging out with your friends and talking and sharing and, you know, being there for each other. Um, and once you, and if you haven't done that, just imagine, you know, sort of this big empty field that's typically dusty. Sometimes, you know, depending on the prison, there may be barbed wire, there may be guys up you know, with guns above you in the turrets. There are no birds flying around because nothing lives around here. It's a place of like death. And yet here you are with your friends and, you know, your indomitable spirit and you're just not going to let that get you down and you're going to make the most of this time. So please open your eyes and please join us in the yard. Um, and I'm going to do as little talking as I can because I want to learn about the experience of being a woman in prison. And, you know, I don't believe enough people have any idea at all what it's all about. We all know about men, but not so much about women. So let me just first start. I'm going to ask one question and shut up as much as I can. Coco, tell me, is going to prison different for a woman than it is for a man? No, it's the same. Same thing goes on in the men prison. It goes on in the women prison. We just treat it just a little bit different because we are women. We are women. So it's the same. Is that, do you feel the same way, Shelly? Um, well, I was, I was federal. And the, I, not all prisons are equal. So there are some horrible women's prisons um, and there are some that are not so horrible. And I was very fortunate to be placed into one of the prisons that wasn't one of the most horrible prisons. Um, I refer to the prison I was in as uh, it was in Dublin, California, here in the Bay Area, and I refer to it as Club Dub because it was, it was really nice. Um, and it's not like, it, it, I mean, as far as prisons go, you know, I mean, it's still prison. It sucked, and I hated being there. But I know compared to um, some of the prisons that my fiance has been in and some of the stories that he's told me, I couldn't even imagine. So based on my experience in the prison that I was at, I would have to say that it is different. Were you at a FPC or FCI? FCI. You was behind the gate in Dublin. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was in Danbury, Connecticut, one of the worst prisons. I think it's in you too. Yeah. Really? Yes. Maurice, do women I, have a tougher I, in prison or do men? I, I really have no words. I, I'm happy that uh, the other women in the room, Shelly and Coco, that you had um, a better experience. I just want to clarify, 
my at my sentencing, I was given 49 months, but I wasn't given a 12 month credit that I spent in Italy waiting extradition. So I actually spent time in probably one of the worst prisons in the world where the floor in my cell was grass and we had no heat, no running water. We had to go outside to shower and we had pumped the water uh, from this like pump in the wall just to get like one minute of cold water. So I'd soap up. This is and, in Italy, and, right? Yeah, to uh, brace myself and put, pump that that um, lever and just freeze, right? <laughs> so I trained my mind that I was kind of like, um, uh, what is that guy? For, I think his name, oh, I can't remember his name, but he like trains to be like healthier by being in the cold. So I convinced myself that that was part of my training, but ultimately at my sentencing, the judge said to me, well, given that you spent a year locked up waiting extradition in Italy, I'm just, I normally would sentence someone in your case to 60 months, but I'm just going to give you 49, which maybe lose the benefit of like an extra two months being re of uh, time uh, being reduced from my uh, federal sentence. Mm -hmm. um, so it, in fact, I did more time than I should have. So I was in fact in for five years. Um, and then I got held back another 45 days at the height of the COVID pandemic because I had two release dates that were changed because there were no flights leaving Kentucky. Um, and I pretty much had to hitch my way up to New York uh, from Kentucky, but I never had a yard. So you guys are lucky. I mean, there was never a yard. We had a patio and I spent three and a half years at Atwood in Kentucky and there was a shooting range directly out, a federal shooting range directly outside, literally within walking distance of my room. And we were never allowed to go outside unless unless this red flag was not um, posted, right? So we had like no place to go. I mean, I made up workouts just to work out. And we had raw sewage in the, running in the basement that the women were forced to clean up with, with no supplies. We had no sanitary napkins. So we would use washcloths whenever we got our cycle. And I would clean up one washcloth and squeeze out the water and put that wet washcloth back in my underwear. Um, I endured five attempted rapes. I woke up to an officer masturbating in front of my face. Uh, I don't think men should be doing uh, do, uh, patrolling and, and checking count time for women and writing mm -hmm. incident reports um, whenever they choose to. If a woman is sleeping, you know, with her body not fully covered up to her neck um, in the middle of the summertime when it's 100 degrees inside and no air conditioning, my experience was horrible. I cannot even tell you. I spent 150 days in isolation for three different, for, for five different times. So 30 day pops in a, in, in isolation. So, in a so is it, is this a function? Do you believe the 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 conditions you were under, Maurice, and and the treatment that you were more vulnerable as a woman? That the guards were all men and they were brutal and and you know had that advantage. Listen, all of the men were like this with all of the women, except for a few. And even in, when I was in Brooklyn, um, after my extradition, uh, five captains and two lieutenants were, uh, it's in the New York Times, you can look, look it up, in 2016, um, in, the, in the springtime of 2016, uh, a number of captains and lieutenants were arrested for raping women in the middle of the night at MDC. So, I mean, this is just oh, yeah. a fact of the conditions where yeah. I unfortunately had to live. Did you see evidence of that sort of behavior, Coco? No, I never seen it, but I knew of it. I knew of it in um, in Danbury. It was a lot of officer uh, uh, dealing with the women. Um, and I seen a lot of officer get walked off the compound as well as professor that come in to teach some of the uh, college courses, uh, sex going on in the um, kitchen, uh, uh, lieutenant office. Uh, it, it was one time where one of the lieutenant asked me to cover for uh, a young lady, and I was really, really shocked. I was really, really shocked that he uh, asked me to do something like that. And when I went and said something to the assistant, ask you to do Lord, what, Coco? I'm sorry. Cover, cover for him, meaning you know, stand guard while he and a, uh, another inmate have sex. Mm -hmm. so yeah, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't against her will. She wanted it. So whatever it was in for her, she agreed to it. But for a lieutenant to ask me that. Wow. And when wow. I did report it to the assistant warden, uh, it was like, 
they didn't believe me. Huh. They didn't believe me. So the inmate decided to say she didn't do it or he didn't say it. And he said he never asked me anything like that. So guess what? They locked me down and had me in the shoe for almost like nine months under investigation. Tell, like tell everybody to, who's not familiar, what's the shoe? The shoe is segregation housing unit. Shelly, you can step in because you did fair times too. And I wanted to just go back a little bit when we was talking about different prison because there are two types of prison, actually three types of prison that's in the federal. You have a USP, a FPC, which stands for Federal Prison Camp. Then you have a FCI, Federal Correctional Institution. So a lot of the women uh, uh, and men get the opportunity to go to either a camp or a FCI depending on your custody level and your time that you got sentenced to. I unfortunately had to go to an FCI because I was sentenced to 22 years in federal prison. So when my time started winding down, I did have an opportunity, Shelly, to go to a camp, which a camp mean that uh, I ain't gonna say you free, but you damn near free because there's no gates and there's no officer. They come by uh, once every couple of hours just to do a walkthrough as far as the unit. So if you want to walk off the camp, you can. Uh, if, if you want to bring any type of contraband on the uh, uh, prison grounds, you can do that as well. You can even bring a man on the compound if you want to. You know, you just got to, you know, plan the time, the time out right so you won't get caught. So that's those are the three prisons that they have in federal prison. USP, United States Penitentiary, FPC, Federal Prison Camp, and FCI. Federal Correctional Institution. So it's a lot of stuff goes on behind those prison walls that people are not aware of. Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of which, Shelley, when you went away, what was what did you discover that most surprised you? Um, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be like. You know, all that I had to go by was the stories that my father told me, which were horrific. And what I saw on TV, and when I when I arrived at the prison and I got off the bus and I got my my blanket and they actually gave me a a, a, a fluffy pillow, I was like, what? I was like blown away because I'd been sleeping on this, you know, this pad about that thick without a pillow for I don't know how long. And then when I walked, actually walked on <clears throat> into the <clears throat> prison yard there were trees and there were flowers and there were squirrels and there were birds and um it was it was not what I expected and when I walked into our my unit I I, I imagined there would be bars and it would be cold and just very women everywhere right, yeah. uh, but but the prison I was at you know we had wooden doors with windows, you know, we had windows we could open. Um, we had curtains on our windows. I mean, it was it was not your typical prison experience. Um, and so I was just, I was blown away. Um, and I thought, I, and I was grateful, don't get me wrong. I mean, geez, I mean, who wants to go to a, who wants to go to prison, but let alone a, a prison like, you know, Marie's, how do you pronounce your name, Marie's? Marie's? Marie's. Yeah, yeah, you know, like hearing her story, I'm just like, oh my God, like it's just, you know, and I have another friend who was in a prison in uh, Columbia and it was horrific. And, um, but yeah, you know, I, I expected it for my experience to be much, much worse. And, um, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't as bad as an experience as I thought it would be. What surprised you, Maurice? Uh, well, I'm surprised that they had uh, different circumstances than than mine. I, I'm I'm just beside myself. Um, I, but in my experience, I didn't realize that um, you know I I had to uh, continue to like deny things or not see things. Um, what do you mean I by didn't that? I want to suffer the punishment. Like after my first attempted rape never been penetrated in all these times, but I have scars all over my body that I'm getting treated now. But I, I, after the first time, I remember like being bloodied up. My, I mean, there's something about men, you know how to punch a woman in the face and like fuck us up. So I just remember like 
bleeding in this isolation room with no blanket and a cement block thinking, okay, what happens now? And I, then I got my period again, but I think it was from the stress. And I had, I was like bleeding in my clothes. I was threatened to get an incident report from destroying federal property for bleeding in my pants. Yeah. Um, I wasn't mm. allowed to take a shower for mm. like six days. So, I mean, I was disgusting. Mm. And then um, the toilet didn't work. Um, you know, I was freezing, no, um, you know, no windows, six by three cell. And then finally, after like, I got, took a shower, a guard pulled me aside and said, listen, you'll be out of here in 30 days, as long as you keep your mouth shut. And I was like, got it. <laughs> so, you know, after 30 days, um, you know, I was, I was let back into general population, but each time I went into the solitary housing unit, I um, went back to find that like everything that I had accumulated from my locker, the guards just unlocked my lock and let people have at it. And everything was gone. So I had to start like everything from scratch, you know, and then borrowing things from people and you borrow one, you pay back twice what the amount is. So it's like, you know, coming out of debt and then starting back in like in debt. Right. So like I end up with like a bill of $600 with only 660 to spend you know, for a month, it was crazy. So of course I, I had to start a hustle. I don't know if any feds in the room, but let me tell you, I hope not, but I never sold drugs in my life. And it's so funny. I gave a Ted talk uh, back in 2014 and I'm writing another one to talk about how I never became a drug dealer until I got to prison. <laughs> like okay. I had to hustle. Listen, yeah. people who had like, medication for um for seizures we're yeah, selling we're it selling right yes <laughs> to, so the people the junkies could get high so yeah. i made myself a middleman right to just like find out who all the people who are candidates for seizures were and say listen i'll buy up your supply and i sold it at a premium <clears throat> were you but expecting I mean, I any of this going uh, in were you expecting this to be the case when you were first no, going? No, 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 no. I didn't know what to expect. I just know in, in, in Italy it was really bad. So I just thought like, all right, how much worse could it get? I mean, Italy is a totally different environment because most of the people who are locked up are gypsies from the, what's called the Roma population, or Roma. It's like the gypsy population, all of Europe. I think there's some in America too. So they live in caravans and they live in plots of land with like thousands of people. And they teach their children to kind of like beg for money while when people like take out their wallet to give money to a begging child, they, the like partners go in and steal the money. So like I, I lived with this gypsy population and it was brutal. I mean, it was fighting every day. I never got into a fist fight in my life until I got locked up. I'm a woman, I'm not trying to do all that. So tell Coco, did you know what you were getting yourself into when they were taking you away? Did you have any insight or any or was it? Yeah, yeah. The insight that I had that I was going to Club Fed. <laughs> I thought that I was going to go to um, a prison where I was able to wear all of my clothes, my mink coats, my jewelry. <laughs> uh, they said it was Club Fed. They said I was going to be eating steaks and lobster and, you know, all the good stuff. So I wasn't anticipating that. But I guess if I was going to do time, you know, I want to do my time, you know, uh, uh, in luxury. You know, that's what I was thinking. And that's what they told me people who that told you your lawyer people that, no people who did time prior like in the 80s this is yeah, way back then i heard you know? Danbury, it was one of the best one of the better um federal prisons too and isn't that where in the 80s in yeah, the 80s. 80s that makes sense <laughs> but it was a it was it was a male prison before it was a female prison <laughs> Yeah. It was a big fire in Danbury and they had to get the guys out and a couple of guys died because they was trapped on the unit. Mm. So they turned it into a women's prison. Yeah. When did you get out, Coco? I came home in 2015. So you know, you knew Miss Turpin? Yes, Rhonda Turpin. Yeah, she. I actually yes. did time with her in Kentucky. Yes, yes. Who is she? Time there. Rhonda Who Turpin. Is she? She's she from knows. Cleveland, Ohio, and she was She's one really of my... Sweet woman. Yeah, she, very sweet woman. She yes, like yes. she stayed to herself and tried to help people as much as she could. That's I mean that's I mean I just know her because she stayed to her. She's one of the few people who stayed to herself. You know, that was my buddy. We still communicate. We wrote a lot of books together. <laughs> Me wow. And wow. Yes, that's we great. What was the together. first book you wrote? What was the title? Honor that bitch. <laughs> <laughs> 
Honor Thy Bitch? Yes. What is it about? It's about a young uh, a young woman from the Chicago uh, making plenty of money, doing the same thing that Mia's is doing. She was taking the city of Chicago by a storm. And she had a lot of uh, uh, men's on her team um, that, that that was supporting what she was doing. She was a cartel. She was a female version this, of the- Is this somewhat style. autobiographical? Oh, mine's coming. It's coming. Oh, this it's wasn't coming. autobiographical. No, 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 no. Mine's is coming. Mine's wow. is coming. So what surprised me when I first came to prison, uh, that I, where I was shot, um, I don't know if you, um, Shelly, had to self-surrender, did you? Mm -hmm. Or see, yeah. see, see, there's a difference when you can self-surrender, meaning that your family can bring you to prison and drop you off. Oh, and well, no. mom or, huh? I had to self-surrender in North Dakota and oh, then wow. from jail to jail. Con Air. Yeah, huh. and then I had to take Con Air. To and, Oklahoma. Did you go yeah. to Oklahoma? No, I went to, or uh, I'm trying to remember. Is that where the, um, is that where the main, yeah, maybe. The I holding facility. Remember. It's yeah, transit. The transit. transit. Yeah, that, yeah, I think, yeah, we did. And then I went to Pahrump in Las Vegas. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so oh. for those who are not familiar, there's a thing called Con Air mm -hmm. and it is the federal system and it's how they transport um, prisoners from one location to another. And free of charge. Free of charge, yeah. It's, it's luxury <laughs> flying at its best. It's, <laughs> if, you know, it's, it's sort of your first, for many people, it's one of the first um, sort of intros into, you know, what your life is gonna be about. Whereby, um, if you're used to flying you know, it's an hour or three hours or five hours and you go from point A from, to point B and you get there and you get off the plane and you're there. Mm -hmm. Whereas this, because they're coordinating the travel of hundreds and thousands of people simultaneously and they're the government, which is to say they're going to just make this as miserable as they can. It might take you weeks and weeks to get to go 600 miles to where you're, you know, ultimately ending up at. And um, you, you know, they shackle you generally, and it's just the most awful, excruciatingly boring, stupid kind of experience you could possibly go through. Is that a fair? So let me just right? say this here, when you say they shackle us, when, they, when he say they shackle us, meaning that our hands are shackled, we got the chain around our waist and then change connects to your feet in this shackle. So you have to walk like this. And okay. if you have to go to the restroom, ladies, oh, we have yeah. a jumpsuit on. We can't get the jumpsuit off. You know, I mean, it's just really, really degrading. I mean, when I tell you degrading, then you have like two to almost like what? 300 inmates on the plane. And men. the majority of them are men. men so you have yeah. to walk through the crowd with the guys. You know, and, and all the guys yep. are sticking their body out so they can rub against you. Yeah, you got this yep. much space, you know? Yep. So you're either going to walk straight or you're going to turn sideways. So they're going to get a feel somehow, which the whole I way. didn't take that time because I wasn't finna see a man in almost 20 years. So get all the free rubs you possibly can get in my mind. But I was so angry. I was so angry that if anybody would stick their shoulder out, I would just cuss them out. Oh yeah. my goodness, I didn't want to touch anyone and I was just so angry. And yeah, I was angry. Today, I'm still pissed off. Yes. But I, I, when I was leaving from um, Brooklyn and DC, I, I spent time in Brooklyn and DC and then was transferred to MCC after the, yes. the rape thing and then brought back to Brooklyn. But let me tell you, when I, the day that I left to go to uh, the airport in upstate New York, got to the airport uh, there were only like six women, but 200 men, right? So they had us standing outside. They loaded up all the men because the men are in the back of the plane. And then they put the women in last. They were just standing outside. Freezing. These U.S. Marshals, um, one, one inc incredibly racist. And I'll tell you how, I mean, it, I'll tell you what he said. <laughs> um, incredibly late racist um, Marshal. One, and he had like disgusting, dirty hands, right? With long, like nails that were just far too long, but cracked a little bit in some parts and I noticed it because he walked up to this one girl gorgeous tall looked like Naomi Campbell 
had her hair in uh, braids with like, uh, but he went up to her and he said, um, he said, all you black bitches come on this plane with all that fucking hair grease. And he gave her some like wipes. And he said, wipe all that disgusting hair grease out of your hair, you dumb black bitch. And he said, if I come back and he took his nail and cut her like this down, like her scalp to right here. And there was a black marshal on the plane who saw what was going on because people started screaming. I was screaming. I was like, what are you doing, right? I was like, I'm next. So he cut her so badly, she started bleeding. The black marshal came out and the two of them got into a fist fight. So they actually canceled our flight because of all that shit that went down. And we all had to go back to our respective locations. And then we flew out the next day. That was my first foray into like what Con Air was gonna be like for me. And then when I got to Oklahoma from New York, got and the, the federal, I mean, the just government, it's just too, it, it's just too big, you know, to, to function. So anyway, got to Oklahoma, the plane pulled up to the federal holding center in Oklahoma. Everybody got off the plane. We all got into put into holding areas, but there weren't enough beds for everybody. So they let more than half of us out, put us on buses and took us to this place called Grady County. Grady County in Atlanta. Have Georgia. you been? Oh yes, they did one oh week. Oh my God. They sprayed Wait. us. Yes, yes. Yo, do you remember the toilets? We had four yes, I toilets. Do. And everybody has, yeah. Like literally, if you have to use the toilet, you like you and I would be sitting next to each other and our legs, our knees would be touching each other yep. while we do our business. So I, I was going to get to that like, part. <laughs> I am not eating and I am not drinking. I am not yes. using a toilet next to somebody. It's literally four women lined up, four women side by side, and it doesn't smell pretty. And you're just lined up with a roll of toilet paper and you're treated like animals are treated better, really. But keep in mind, though, keep in mind, not only is the fourth toilets is there you have 30 women in that cell and they all land on the floor right they, they they're not beds. Up again. so everybody is just sitting with their back against the wall trying to get some sleep but you can't get sleep because you got other women talking then you got maybe two or three women trying to cover a young lady who's trying to use the bathroom in privacy i mean that is so degrading and, and, and there are cameras in that bathroom do yes. you remember that like it was a camp, yeah. So they only supposedly be able to see the back of us, not the front of us, which I knew was some bullshit. Wow, right. That is why I asked everyone to block me, shield me, so I could use the bathroom. And if you was on your period at that time, that's another fucked up situation. Did you ever have enough maxi pads or tampons? Because we, they never gave us any. And what no, we it did. Was about a, it was about the grace of God that every time that I went through Oklahoma, going back to court to fight my case, that I would not be on my monthly. Never. Um, so, so you, you know, at least uh, Coco and Maurice, um, and I know that you, Shelley, have had your interactions with guards when you were in there. Um, it was brutal or worse in dealing with the prison personnel. What about when you're first getting there? And what about other inmates, other women who were there when you first get there? How did you find them? Were there people who were, were you worried about connecting with them? Were there women that were helpful? And, you know, or were you at, at so, such a heightened level of alert that you weren't open to anybody? You know, what was your experience? Shelly, you want to start? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I really didn't, um, well, when I, the first, first day I was there, or maybe the second day I was there first day, it was, I was, it was surreal. Um, but I didn't really, I mean, what was surreal? Just the whole, just being there and, and just, you know, uh, just trying to get adjusted. And, and as far as the people go, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, I didn't have any, I didn't encounter any issues, but I will say the second day there was a, uh, a big fight. Um, and so that was, that was scary. I witnessed that. And <laughs> I, I, I didn't know what to expect the, you know, from that day forward, if that was going to be something that would happen all the time, because, you know, I, all I had to go by was movies and, 
in in TV and um, but it, it it really wasn't that bad. You know, the people weren't that bad. You're just in a you're in a basically another community with a bunch of women that you know made some mistakes and just want to move on from their past. I mean, of course, you have you know the bad the people that are you know the bad apples i guess you could say or the people that aren't wanting to change that aren't trying to be become rehabilitated and i just stared clear from them um and you were able to figure out who they were oh yeah i mean yeah yeah and um i mean the path that i was on you know i when i when i got to prison you know i had already done a bunch of research my whole plan like i had i had a um I already had, you know, basically a plan for what I was going to do while I was in prison and how I was going to stay productive and, you know, utilize every program that they had possible. And so for me, when I was in prison, it was like being at school um, because I'd wake up in the morning and I would go to my various classes during the day and then I'd come back at night um, or, you know, in the afternoon around after three thirty, four o'clock. And that was my day every single day. And, um, you know, I, I, I got involved with church and the choir and, you know, I got involved with a, the, the people were on, who were on that same page and that were headed down that same path and just wanted, you know, uh, you know, to move on from their mistakes and become a better person. All right. So you were able to identify them. Coco, when you first got there, were you confronted with any early situations that you had to like kind of size things up quickly and make a determination or any problems initially? How were the women to you when you first got there? When I, well, it was a young lady by the name of Michelle West. Uh, one of, uh, one of my friends from Chicago had did time with her in the early uh, 90s. So she found out that I was coming, I had got sentenced and I was designated to come to Danbury. So when she found out that the shipment had came in and I was on that bus load, she was waiting at R&D for me to get off the bus. So when I first got there, I didn't know uh, where they had me at because uh, a lot of the women, they was looking like me. And so I thought it was co-ed, but they was women. Uh, so she uh, like literally like took me up under her wing, you know, say, I heard about your case. I know uh, a good friend of yours, which is a good friend of mine who did time. And uh, they just so happened to put me on the same unit with her. I didn't have to confront anyone until like maybe a couple of years into my time. And it, it had to it had to do something with the microwave. You know, <laughs> it was the microwave, literally. So no one uh, I think that the, the people that was the women that was there with me, I, they looked at me and they just felt that I was just like, I was an angry black bitch. I, I, I kept that look on my face because I was really, really mad, you know, that I was in prison. And- um, But were you putting that face on? I mean- No, I was, I was just- in prison, mad. you learn the look, right? Like, I mean, I, don't I, fuck I came, with me, look. Yeah, I came in the door just looking like that, you know, do not fuck with me right now. Because right. I am mad that I got sentenced to 262 months. And right now, anybody can get it. I was just I was just really angry, you know? I mean, angry and bitter. Because not only did uh, they lock me up for 22 years, <clears throat> they locked my husband up too. So we both got convicted and they took us straight into custody. Not even giving us an opportunity to say, I see our, we see it, we'll see the kids later, you know? Uh -huh. I didn't get okay, to, so, I didn't get so you didn't anything. have to deal with inmate issues initially. How about you, Maurice? Did you have any of that? Oh my God. So I got, I got arrested in, in Italy in my apartment. So when I was taken into custody, um, I was, they segregated us based on color. Um, so I got put in with a, a Nigerian, uh, like in cells with Nigerians. So they were either human traffickers or the people who are trying to escape their respective countries from Somalia or um, Morocco, taking boats from little inflatable boats from North Africa into Italy. And they were caught at the border in Lampadusa and then brought to prison, right? But the problem was the traffickers who were also getting caught were put in with the people who had paid them to get them out. So it like the day that I got in, you automatically go into like uh, isolation typically for three days, but they only left me in for like 10 hours in isolation. So I never got sleep. 
this one nice guard came over and gave me a couple of cigarettes and she's like, you're going to need these. I was like, why? <laughs> well, they actually, I needed them to like buy some level of security when I got put in those rooms because those people, we had like, uh, we were locked down from 8 p.m. until until 8 a.m. the next day. But in each one of those cells, we had like um, a hot plate, but it had like real fire, like a gas burner. So you can make coffee um, with a traditional Bialetti coffee maker where you like screw the top on off and like put the coffee inside and screw it back on. Anyway, like these women would like boil water at night and like attack each other with that. So it was like fights all the time after lights out. And the guards, there was no like um, communication. Like we had metal doors and cell blocks and no guards patrolling overnight. Not like in America where there's count time. So like it went down overnight. And like the first couple of nights I was like, I need these cigarettes to like, just leave me the fuck alone. So I gave a cigarette away, away the first night. The next night I gave the second cigarette away. And then the third night I was in a fight. And then, um, so that earned some level of respect. I got put into a different cell because of the fight with like a mix of Italian um, and Romanian people because now it was like, a, I got into a bad fight um, and I hurt someone. So they put me in a, in a room where I wouldn't be in conflict, right? But when I got to that room, there was this Italian woman called Georgina who was known for being a bully and stealing and extorting people for things. And like the first couple of nights, she just would come by and like stand in front of my bed like this. And I was just like, I just, I don't know what happened. Like something like flicked inside of me. And the next time she did it, I just jumped up and I was like, boom, I knocked her out. Everybody was like, oh, you're gonna get in so much trouble. So I ran to my bunk, I grabbed the book and I laid down and I pretended like nothing happened, tried to control my heartbeat, slow it down. The guards came by, they're like, what happened? And she was crying and acting like she was a victim and everybody knew she wasn't a victim. And the guard was just like, whatever happened, I'm not in it. Mm. And that 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 like was the transformation of so, me, like getting acclimated to that environment but the more new people who came in right there was always a wave of new people and then people mm -hmm. getting put into different parts so you're never safe right so you have gypsies and you have romanians and you have drug traffickers human traffickers and you would be surprised how many human traffickers go in there and those people the women especially it's like they're trained mma fighters these women, it's not even like, they, they, there's no talking, right? It's either like, you look at me the wrong way or you make me uncomfortable, it's on. There was a woman there, it's actually a famous story where I was, I don't wanna to take too much stage time, but this is how bad it got. There was a woman who was accused of ki killing her three children and then feeding them to pigs that were on her property. This is in 2015. So everyone knew about this story when she came in. When she came in, the night she came in, right, and the guards did nothing to protect her because it's a Catholic country and nobody really believes in that, especially a woman committing that type of crime. They scalped her. They took uh, blades and were cutting after they scalped her and cut like pieces of her hair, holding it as like a memento of her scalp and her hair and, and killed her and left her body there. Mm. And I saw it. I, I just walked away because I don't want to be part of it. I don't want to witness it. But I saw it when that mob came after her and I was like, I'm out of here. It's oh, crazy. Man. All right. It's so not that, like America. Okay. It's not. So, so when I got to Brooklyn, like the first night I got to, Bro to Brooklyn, I, I got in, I came in, I left in uh, like a 6 a.m. flight. I got into America around 4 p.m. Uh, I was held at MC MDC in Brooklyn in the shower because there's no holding cell for women in a shower, right, for eight hours. They let me in upstairs at two in the morning. And as soon as I got there, I got into a fight just because I had been wired that way in Italy. Mm. Yeah, mine uh, was horrible. Yeah, it's, it sounds like Italy was awful. So, it, it, you know, you mentioned this woman who came in, or this woman had a reputation. Shelly, there, is there a hierarchy that you were aware of? When I was in prison, there was definitely a hierarchy. Like the mafia guys, you know, they were well respected, you know, and nobody messed with them. And oh, yeah. we and we actually had um, re very religious Jewish guys 
who were politically very connected and they had a lot of juice in the prison and no one would mess with them. Were there any, was there a hierarchy that you were aware of in prison among the prisoners? Oh yeah, there were, there were women that were in the mafia that were very well respected as well. Um, you know, um, there were, you know, a handful of women that were rather large. <laughs> You know, that were, you know, nobody messed with and, and they kind of ran things too. Um, and, you know, some of them were, you know, were bullies, uh, you know, but I just, every chance that I got to steer clear from them, I would. I, I, I didn't even, like, if I knew they were in the, the like, I would, I would make sure that I was, you know, in my classes from the time I woke up until the time, you know, until, until it was time to go to bed. I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't hang around or even put myself in those positions to be around them because I knew that if I did, it would be bad. Um, I did almost get into one fight though with my, one of my bunkies. Um, but um, that's about as crazy as it got for me. I mean, I was just, I was, you know, I focused on my relationship with God and hanging out with fellow Christians. And so that kind of, I think that put me in like a different light with a lot of the prison population. Oh, well, she's a Christian, you know? Um, and so I didn't get messed with a lot. What, what did you say? What, what was the um, hierarchy where you were, Coco? Who was at the top? Who was at the bottom? The Colombians. <laughs> We're at the top. <laughs> yeah, it was at the Colombian was at the top, and it was a whole entire family in there. It was the, gr the the grandmother, the mother, the two daughters, and the granddaughter. I promise you, the whole family. I was really, really shocked. I'm like, they took nice the whole family. Thing. Yeah, the whole family was in there. You know, even when we go into the visitor room, um, you would see a whole lot of women, but they was they they was Colombians, the sisters, the other sisters who didn't. Uh, uh, get locked up with them, and I think the um, I think the the lowest ones that was on the totem pole probably was um, the Caucasians. I mean, you know, they 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 wasn't getting any respect in there at all. You know, a lot of the blacks and a lot of the Columbians was just running over running over them. You know, having them doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Uh, they was very very passive, very passive and scared for their life. And uh, but the Colombian had a lot of things in the prison on lock. Really, From the kitchen to the laundry room to commissary, you had to pretty much go through them. I heard something. I'm not sure where I heard. It was a woman was taught. Maybe it was in Clubhouse. Even a woman was talking about her experience in prison, and she was talking about her being part of a family. That there were family groups of women where there would be a mother and someone had the role of the father, I guess, and some yeah. children. Yes. Yes. Can you explain yes. that? Because we didn't have that in, in, to my knowledge, in the men's prison. Yeah, it was me either. either. I never heard that yeah. before. Well, it, yeah, it's like I had a, I had a son, which was a young girl that was, um, she was a lesbian. I mean, uh, uh, she was a boy and, um, I used to call her my son, and, that's, and that is what she wanted to be called. And uh, my bunky was her aunt, which was Michelle West. And in other units, you had the grandmom and the grandfather, and then you had the mother and the father, which like is like, just say it's a couple, you know, one gonna be the aggressive <laughs> and one gonna be the passive one, and they're gonna be the other inmate mother and father, and they family. Hmm. And they ride together. Hmm. Yeah, so and, it, it was going on a lot in the women prison where I was where I was at. It was. Yeah. Was was that was that um, okay as far as the guards and the prison was concerned they, or not? Yeah, it was. They didn't care. They didn't care. They, they didn't care. No, they didn't care because after being in prison for so long, you 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 that is your family. <laughs> that is your family. Uh -huh. You know, you look at some of the women in there just like your mother, and some of the other women that. Uh, um, um, live the lifestyle of a, a a man. They call him their father. Yeah, we would we would call the, some of the women our prison moms. Yeah, mm -hmm. we refer to them as prison moms. 
we had one, um, her name is Mama Dukes. Um, and, uh, you know, she was, uh, she would teach all of us how to, um, uh, to knit. So it was, uh, <laughs> crochet, everything. Yeah. Crochet. Yep. <laughs> Speaking of families, I, I was amazed in prison was <clears throat> the extent to which people would do their own cooking. Mm -hmm. And someone mentioned the microwaves mm -hmm. and we had, we had this whole wall of microwaves and, you know, they would get disgusting because they would be used so frequently. And then the guards would get mad at a certain point and just grab someone, clean up all these microwaves. But particularly the Latin guys, I was in prison. I was in Florida. So there were a lot of Latin guys. And those guys never, ever, ever went to the cafeteria to eat. And I used to wonder, like, <laughs> what are, what are, where do they go? What do they do? And then I discovered from the commissary, you know, they would buy wraps and beans and the simul like plastic cheese. It wasn't really real cheese. <laughs> the cup cheese. And they would, <laughs> yeah. And they would make these like wraps and yeah. burritos. And sometimes yeah. they would sell them. And, th and then they would make these incredibly you know, complicated meals. <laughs> and then there'd be like a birthday and they were cooking cakes. Cakes. Did you do any of that, Coco? Yes, I did it all. I was selling dinners on the compound. What would you sell? What was the most popular thing you made? Macro patties and fried rice and chilaquitas. Potato okay, rolls, banana pudding, cheesecakes, wow. uh, egg rolls. You name it, I made. I was selling dinners every Saturday and Sunday. That was my hustle. Was it good, do you think? Yeah, yes, yes. Everybody who worked in Unicor uh, that get paid almost 200 and some dollars a month, I was getting that on the compound. There were in, in federal prison, there's this program called Unicor <laughs> where it's like a separate company that's not really a company. It's part of the government, but they it's make it the a government. company and they have inmates that they pay very, very little to do like to make bedding or to make furniture or all kinds of other things. And, you know, these are people for, for inmates who are working. I mean, I used to work in the, in the cafeteria and I think I made like 11 cents a week or something, but the people in Unicor made a lot more money. Right. Yes. And yeah, they had like money to cents, afford 63 cents. 63 cents an hour. Yeah, 63 cents. And they could use that money in the commissary to buy like toothpaste and deodorant and then, you know, whatever, batteries for a radio. But they would buy meals from you, right? Right. So, Richard, let me just tell um, our listeners this, but they don't even know. Please. They had the call center, right, Shelly, in Tallahassee, Florida. So, yeah, when they... you guys dial 311 information, It'd be the women over there answering the phone call for you guys. I didn't know that. For what? Oh yeah, yes, they'd be asking. A lot of the magazines they would, um, you know, send out subscriptions for yes. all different types of magazines, for ma ma magazines on boats and mechanics and you know, you name it. You know, they were they were trying to get. They were a call center for another company. Yeah, it was, yes, it was a call center and. Uh, <laughs> And when you dial, you know, call in 311 for information, some of the women be answering your call and they be in prison. And Danbury, where I was at, we was making cable wires for uh, Comcast and uh, AT&T. That's true. The at at yeah. the Unicor where I was, I wasn't, so the Unicor program where I was in Kentucky, um, the only people who were work there were women who were willing to perform sexual acts for the guards. So that was going on for like two and a half years. I never said I never, Kentucky. I never wrote a cop out for anything. Like it's not my business because I was doing my own dirt. So I'm like, I'm not, I would never. But anyway, um, one of the girls who used to smuggle in some stuff for me that I would sell, she was working there. Um, she's like, yeah, in five more days, it's all going down. They're firing everybody. But I was like, what do you guys make over there anyway, right? She's like, we make radios for the military. We make wiring for... Um, telecom companies they make a lot of stuff they uh, like I was in shock they might make casings for for um, weapons and I was in shock about that but you know one of the uh, when you mentioned Tallahassee there was a girl who came from Tallahassee a couple of girls from Tallahassee 
who came from that location to where I was in Kentucky because there was like the shootout between the guards and um, did you hear about this? Like a guard got kidnapped because yes. mm-hmm. he has yeah. raped a girl and gave her yep. an HIV. Yep. He ended up killing himself in the standoff. Yep. And I, in crazy. the parking lot, in the parking lot. So yeah. let me let me tell you about the yard. So she came just, and told me, so she's like, I have HIV. So that just, wow. someone was asking her something about braiding her hair. And she's like, I'm going to tell you before I braid your hair, I have HIV. I was like, okay, well, yeah. I can't catch it from you for braiding yeah. my hair. Go ahead, Coco. Sorry. You, um, how I got connected with a couple of officer uh, uh, in Danbury, I was on the yard. And I was working out, uh, running the track. I would do this every day. As soon as they say uh, a compound open, uh, I would straight, go straight to the yard and start, you know, working out before we get ready to go to work, before work call. And for the longest, the officer had been watching me. And one day he called me to, uh, he called me over to his office. I heard it on the speaker, you know. And the funniest thing, they wouldn't even call me. They wouldn't say Nicole Davis report to the lieutenant office or to unit uh, 13. They would say Coco Davis, which would be the funniest shit ever to hear someone calling you by, by your street name. And I go over there and and he was like, well, you know, I've been watching you for quite some time and I, I've been listening to your phone calls. I've been listening to your phone calls and um, I, I see, you know, the money that you be getting in, in the prison. And I was like, uh, so you saying that to say what? And he was like, you know, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, no, I don't. What are you saying? And he was like, you know, uh, you know, listen, your brother hurt me. And I, when he said that, I already knew. I already knew that when he said that a brother is hurting, meaning that you is not getting paid good over here. And you watching my uh, account as well as listening to all of my phone calls and they are being recorded. And he started bringing me stuff in that I could sell. So I started making a lot of money off of wedding bands. Wedding bands, because the officer was bringing me jewelry in. He was bringing in wedding bands for you to sell to inmates who wanted to- Get married. Get married to other inmates. To other inmates, absolutely. And I would give him cash. Wow. Yep. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. You're I would balling. not have thought of that as a hustle in prison. Yeah, every you know they would have the marriage, right, Shelly? And where you was at, they would have mar- uh, uh, a wedding on the yard, uh, in the recreation. Just don't get caught. <laughs> Just don't get caught uh, facilitating something like that, or you going to the shoe. But uh, we had a whole wedding on the yard, and somebody got busted somebody told that it was going on down there and everybody who participated in it uh got in trouble and i was the caterer yeah mm-hmm. well i never heard about it of the, anything like that happening where i was well, ever. yes but i oh. was a bit i used to buy banana pudding and like <laughs> and i used to buy the prison version of sushi all the time well, you know, what was prison version sushi uh did you ever make that the sushi so- Sushi. No. Oh, so I didn't it's make like it. the packaged salmon, rice. packaged salmon and packaged tuna, and the kefi rice where you yep, throw the rice, yeah. boiling water inside and you seal the package until the rice fluffs up, and then you just roll it, roll out the rice when it's cool, and put in like stuff that you stole from the kitchen, like jalapeno and avocado if you could get one smuggled in, um, cucumber, and just the pre-cooked tuna and or sushi and roll it. And you can buy so- soy sauce from the commissary. Yeah. You know, in men's prison, where I, when I first went to prison, they brought me into my housing unit. And I, the minute they opened the door, I was hit with the smell that I had never smelled in my life. And it was like a punch mm-hmm. in the face. It was so awful to me. And I said, what is that smell? And they said, it's mackerel. Oh, it's go, the worst. Mackerel? What is mackerel? It's canned mackerel. And he didn't say mackerel, he said mac. It's it's mac. And I go, what the hell is mac? I've never heard, they are the fish, mackerel. And I go, well, I've heard of tuna fish. I've eaten that. What the hell is mackerel? And I dis- And I learned that mackerel, which is high in protein apparently, so guys who were working out particularly are interested in it, but in in you know, where I was, mackerel was the unit of barter. 
that, you know, you could get somebody to do your laundry or make your bed every morning or, or whatever, and two Mac or one Mac, and everything was based upon mackerel. And that smell, I will never, ever forget. What, what Shelly, what will you never forget about prison? What one thing? What one thing? Um, how good the cheesecakes were. Uh, unbelievable. Creamer with lemon juice and these little cheap packets of, of um, cream cheese that are just it was disgusting by itself, but when you mix those ingredients together, I mean, it was amazing. <laughs> I love the cheesecake. <laughs> cheesecake. What will you never forget, Maurice? The taste of the irony blood um, dripping down the back of my nose after getting punched by guards in the face, just tr praying and holding my nose, hoping that it's not broken. I'll never forget that taste. I'll never forget that shock between, my, like, under my eyes. And to the, like, it's almost like, um, I don't know, like a numbing sensation that goes to the back, like over the top of uh, wow. your scalp. So Ouch. I've I've dealt with that five separate times. And it's always like, I'm telling you, it's like these guards train for that shit. Like, hey, are you, are you hurts. worried, Maurice, about getting in a fight now that you're out? That like that? God, no. Uh -uh. Mm -mm. Okay, that's not going to happen. No, I mean, that's actually, I probably have some trauma that I need to deal with. But like when I was the halfway, I, I, I had a flip phone and I was asking some guy for directions. Did I tell you the story? Yes. This, uh, so this guy, I asked this one stranger for directions and I, he's like, why don't you just use your phone? And I was like, because I have a flip phone. <laughs> but the way he said it to me was almost like so dehumanizing, like he was trying to phone shame me and something like, I don't know, it was like just not stable inside of me. And I smacked that phone out of his hand into the street. And I was like, oh my God, what did I just do? I'm staying at a halfway, get the fuck out of here. And I ran so fast. And yeah. then I called like friends. I'm like, I need therapy. Like I really <laughs> need therapy, but I don't know how to do it. And I don't know when I want it. Cause I haven't cried really since all of this. Like I didn't cry while I was away. So I have a lot to unpack, but you I don't will. know when that's going to start. You got time. I mean, I just got out. What, what, um, what, do you, will you never forget about prison, Coco? What's that one thing? Can't hear you. Are you muted? Adrian, did you meet, mute Coco? Coco, did you meet, mute Coco? Okay. I don't have any control over this. Oh, there we go. No, Adrian. Coco is muted, Adrian. Okay, there you go. There we go. Okay, uh, can you repeat the question again? What is the one thing about prison you're never going to forget? Being uh, a late night shakedown. And it was, oh. a fight. it was a fight broke off. And it was a real, real bad fight that we had all witnessed. And the lieutenant came on there. A couple of lieutenants came on the unit and woke us up out of our sleep. And they wanted everybody to strip because they wanted to see who had any marks on their body. So the women who was all standing there in our underwear as the officers parade up and down the aisle while we standing like this, I couldn't believe it. So I kept trying to grab the sheet and they was like, don't touch nothing, you know? And every time he was said, don't touch nothing, me and my roommate, we would still try to cover ourselves. And when he came, he snatched the sheet from me and right in my face and he was screaming at me and the spit in my, you know, was all in my face. And I was getting really, really angry. And, and his spit hit my mouth. i never forget that. You'll never forget never. that. All right, then let's change the channel a little bit here. What, when you got out, was what? the best thing that happened to you the thing that you said, oh man, I'm so happy I'm out. What did you, what was the experience? Walking through that, walking through R&D door where the visitors come in at, I had the opportunity to walk out of there and to see my daughter, uh, to see my daughter standing there with flowers and balloons. Uh, 
just taking their mother in their arm. That was one of the most beautiful thing. And I stopped right there and I just got down on the ground and I kissed the ground and looked up to God and wow. said, thank you. And I can hear the women beating on the door. And all I can remember was my roommate said, never look back, never look back, never, never look, look back. back. And I didn't look back as much as I wanted to look back and said that and scream loud that I would not forget you guys. I'm coming mm -hmm. back for you guys. I just continue on and got in the truck. And I told my sister to get me the fuck off this compound. Wow. That had to be powerful. So we have a few questions from the folks who have been um, observing and listening and watching that I'd like to share. Somebody asked um, you, Coco, regarding those wedding bands, were they metal, in fact? Were they allowed? Well, they were not brought in legally, so uh, it's not a question that they were allowed or not allowed, but were they real or that were they? Yes, 10 they karat gold. Mm -hmm. Really? Yep. Okay. Ten carry go. All right. Um, I want. I understand. There's a woman by the name of Susan, who Adrian has been talking to uh, in the audience, who would love to come in and say hello. Is it? Are this? Are you Susan? Yes, I'm Susan. Hi, Susan. How are you? Welcome. Thank you. Where are you uh, located? So I'm in Fishkill. I am actually um, the fiance to one of your dearest friends, Irving Stitsky. Oh, okay. Who we had on last week. Yes, you did. And he's actually here with me, but you know, we're kind of like inseparable now. Okay. Um, as far as um, federal time, I've never done federal time, but I've done time. What, um, what, what time I, did you do? I did um, five and a half years in North Carolina for a probation violation. Oh my God. But I'm from New York, so they thought I was a flight risk. And when I got out of prison, I sure was. I went right back to New York because I felt like New York would never have given me, after doing four and a half years on probation, they never would have given me. They would have just said, you're done. Mm -hmm. But I also did time in New York. Um, I was addicted to opiates. I had an interesting life. So instead of learning how to deal with life on life's terms. I learned how to deal with prison life on life's terms. But when you, when Coco, when you said 311, I know all about the travel expeditions because I was in the one in North Carolina. Oh, okay, yeah. So um, anybody that, um, it was travel and tourism over there. Um, so I learned <laughs> how to do that. I, uh, I learned how to make license plates and almost lose my thumb. I was in the law library in New York, um, in up in Albion, New York. So I did, uh, like I was law librarian. I went and got a degree in paralegal. That wasn't good enough to me. I went and got a degree as a chef. That wasn't good enough to me. I, I always kept busy. I was never with a click. Unfortunately, I did a lot of time with Amy Fisher. Um, Good old Amy Long Fisher Island. was with Joey Badafuco, yes. yeah, which Good was big Long news Island. in New York. Yeah. Um, um, Su Susan, excuse me for one second. Um, Shelly has to leave us. She actually has another meeting to go. She's a very important person. Shelly, before you go, give me a one minute shameless plug for something you're doing now that you want people to know about. Um, one thing that I've done um, now was since I've gotten out is I've really tried to be a voice for the formerly incarcerated and I um, took it upon myself to um, uh, you know, speak to the public and not only in the US but internationally about the, you know, to companies trying to encourage them or urge them to hire formerly incarcerated and why they should hire us and give us a second chance. And so if you guys get a chance, you know, please check out my TED talk. Um, it's uh, Shelly Winner. If you just type in Shelly Winner TEDx, it pulls right up, right up. And it's, um, the title is why, um, why hiring formerly incarcerated is best for your team. So I talk, uh, you know, uh, my, my goal is to bring, you know, educate the world, um, you know, uh, about the benefits of, of hiring us and, and why we're amazing. As, as indeed you are. Thank you so much for joining us. Sh Shelly's going to go skiing, I think, behind <laughs> her. 
Thanks, but I will friend. speak. I will, I will speak to you soon. Yes. Thank yes. you. Lovely to meet you Thank virtually. You. Yes. Lovely to meet you. Bye, everyone. Um, I'm sorry I interrupted you, um, it's, it's, um, I, Susan. I actually want to go out there and educate the world on why it is very beneficial to hire a felon. I mean, <laughs> it, as scary as it may sound, they're probably, you already know what they've done. You already know that they've been incarcerated. They're coming to you with an open book. So it's also a tax write-off, no matter what state you're in. It is a huge tax write-off to hire somebody that has a felony behind you. Now, would I put somebody with a white-collar crime in a bank? Probably not a good idea. But there are other fields that they can learn from. And this is what I've been, I mean, I know that Irving wants to go out there and, you know, help others. I want to go out there, especially women that have been abused, because I know that sense all too well. And, you know, I want to be able to go back in there. It took me a long time to be able to go and see Irving because of my record, because we're both white collar. So they didn't want to let me in. Right. So I used to joke around with him and I said, you know what's going to happen? They're going to let me in. You're going to come home. That's exactly how that happened. Irv um, is, is an old friend of mine, and he was on the yard last week. Irv um, had, a, a, he was charged with a nonviolent crime, and he decided to take it to court, which to trial, which rarely occurs in the federal system. And while he could have settled, taken a plea agreement for seven or eight years, um, he went to trial and received an 85 year sentence. He was 10 years into his sentence when a guard came to his cell and said, pack up your stuff, you're leaving. President Trump Just pardoned him. Yep. And that night he slept in his sister's home in Connecticut and he's out now and, uh, and reunited with his loved ones and Susan and that's where he belongs. Um, congratulations. Yeah, congratulations is right. <laughs> <laughs> he says, thank you. So Coco, you're involved. I know you're involved with several amazing organizations. Um, I want people to hear about what you're doing and how they can get in touch with you. So can you please share that? Um, my organization is the Talk to Me Foundation for kids whose parents are incarcerated. I do a lot for the kids because kids are not heard of. And a lot of people don't know the impact that prison have on our children. So mm -hmm. I, cre I created a safe space for kids to be open and speak what they are feeling. But I also advocate for um, a young lady by the name of Michelle West, who's serving two life sentences plus 50 years in Dublin, California right now. To this day, I was up there in D.C. when the riot was going on because we was doing a, a candle lighting for Michelle West. And I was saying that if you want to make America great again, free Michelle West. And I started naming off so many other women that I, I was trying to get the president to give clemency to, as well as how we did Miss Allison Johnson, Tynese Hall with the Kim Kardashian. I also, uh, I am the founder of the Sister of Support House here in Chicago by way of Indiana. I purchased this home. So when women get out of prison, they have a safe place to come to, to start all over again. And I spent every dime in my pocket rehabbing this property, furnishing this property off, and um, just trying to make it comfortable for these women. But I, um, I am the uh, executive uh, uh, founder of the Stop the Violence here in Chicago. Uh, I sit on the board with um, Beauty After the Boss, um, the National Council, um, who we fight and advocate for women uh, justice, as well as uh, uh, trying to free these women in mass incarceration, <laughs> women and girls. And you all can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, Talk To Me Foundation, which would be the TLK, the number two foundation. And you can email me at talktomefoundation at gmail.com. You can check out my webpage at talktomefoundation.org. And it's the number two, not T-O. And it's T-L-K-2 Foundation. Talk to me Foundation, yes. 
Right. At Gmail? Right. Yep. T A L K, the number two, me oh, foundation. Oh, the number two. Oh. The number two at gmail.com. You can check out the right. web page and everything that we have been doing, uh, center around prison reform. Um, I the, uh, I sit there with the National Council because we uh, sit on the board with legislation trying to change laws. We are the one who got the law changed with Band of Shackles. And as you all can see now uh, here in Chicago, Illinois, that we just passed a law where there's no burnout. You know, so that's great. And that's in our favor. So no, yeah, what? Of, bail out. You don't have to. Oh, bail. To put no bail. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, um, so we got a lot of work to do and um, I'm ready to uh, continue this work. As uh, far as uh, prison form, criminal justice, um, it's been a struggle for me, but I'm not giving up. Even through this pandemic, we're still making things happen. Yeah, nobody thinks you're going to give up. That's for sure. Maurice, I also know that you are involved with a couple of very exciting things. Yes. So I'm here in Dumbo, Brooklyn. And, um, you know, first of all, I just want to say thank you for everybody who to, to everybody who's listening and uh, to the panel and to anybody who's asking questions. Thank you so much for even entertaining uh, this conversation. My main focus right now um, is a campaign to identify people who are formerly incarcerated as a minority group so they can get the benefit of uh, fair hiring practices, um, access to fair housing, um, people who have lost their licenses, getting them reinstated um, so that it can actually go back to their uh, historical job and, and focus on their core competency. Um, getting their voting rights reinstated. Um, I've spoken with the NRA. Um, the NRA thinks, and I think it's a constitutional right for someone to have a gun. Um, so anyone who doesn't have a gun enhancement or someone who doesn't have a violent crime uh, attached to a, a weapon should at least have the choice to uh, purchase, uh, to, get, to get access to buy, buy a gun. Fair credit reporting, I think, is important because if someone spends 10, 15 years in prison, you know, their credit starts out really, really bad. And that's a, a bad way to engage and give people the, the opportunity um, to re-enter society. I think um, falling into this category of identifying people as a minority group, which I think is important, like LBGTQ, right? You have, you know, more than 80 million people who are dealing with this, one in three people, um, giving them access to for example, go to Canada, right? America will take anyone pretty much who has a criminal record, but like, I mean, I don't know what's so special about Canada where their people can come here, but we're not allowed to go there. That should be changed. And one of the biggest issues that I'm um, talking about and lobbying for is giving people um, the right to collect retroactively all fees for services rendered while they were incarcerated. So looking back historically to how much time they actually did work, right? And over time and getting a fair working rate wage upon release, but also retroactive fees for anybody who's been in prison from 1900, if they're still alive now, because that's wrong. And I want that phrase from the 13th amendment. I know it's incredibly ambitious, but slavery is abolished in America. And anyone who's incarcerated should not, not be treated like a slave. They should not be abused by a slave. Guards need to be held accountable. I, I, I'm still also dealing with one of the guards who tried to rape me. I discovered this summer committed suicide. So I was dealing with like, at one point, praying for that, <laughs> something bad to happen to him. And then kind of like reconciling that with my, with God and my soul thinking like, well, you know, I should have never prayed for that. That's really bad, but I'm not upset about it. So I'm also dealing with like a lot of unpacking mentally. We but understand. This platform has given me an opportunity to connect with people like you and Coco and, and Shelly to, to advocate for the people who don't have a voice. We were strong enough to get through and that's not everyone, you know, mm -hmm. not everyone is, is strong enough to get through you know, like guards playing jokes, letting people listening to other phone calls. Coco, I've been there right with you where a guard will play back a phone call. Also of like people who have, I don't know why, but they're talking to the families about me and something I did to hurt them or allegedly, right? Like, I don't need that. Like, but guards shouldn't be showing me that stuff. Okay. Right? Or trying to compromise my safety. Sorry, Richard, I'm going to finish it really quickly. But the last two things that I think are super important. Um, so I'm, I'm also very interested in dismantling the business of prison. So if anyone has a loved one in prison and you want to send a free 
email photo from even screenshot shotting this video go download emilio.org it's a m e e l i o.org you can download this free app and you can send infinite free photos free photo postcards letters books um i want to get your books on the app coco so you gotta hit me up you can dm me my dm is my name uh maurice a l my first name maurice which is in the screen and my middle name a l e x i a maurice alexia um and then worth rises uh with bianca tylek who's um just campaigned to get the owner of the Detroit Pistons removed from NBA ownership position because he owns Securus. Um, so yeah, we don't have to talk about that here. Um, but you know, I, I'm just a, an advocate of taking apart the companies that are breaking up families and profiting from us. Okay, yeah, that Sorry. keeps you busy um, for sure. Um, and let me take a moment, if I may, to tell you about what we do. Um, we, um, at commissary.club, um, we, A, are involved with employment for the formerly incarcerated. We were successful in getting thousands of people deserving men and women jobs. The coronavirus hit, and of course, that negatively impacted that work, but it's starting to come back. Um, but we use the time to build out the first social network for folks with records. And that's commissary.club. And I urge anybody with a record, and I would ask you as a personal favor, if you have other people who have records to please invite them. But we believe that together we're much stronger than we are apart. That we are a population that is systemically pushed into the shadows, living with shame, living with fear of getting into trouble. And let's face it, there are 70 million of us. We could elect any president we want. We have huge buying power, but nobody really pays much attention or really gives a shit about us. I don't think that's right. I don't think it's right. And I don't think anybody here thinks it's right that someone commits a crime, particularly when they're young, they do their time, they come out, and yet they have a life sentence of stigma and second-class citizenry and no opportunities to move on with their life in a productive way. That's just not right, and I don't think anybody thinks it's fair. And we need to come together and speak with one voice because together we're much stronger. And that's what we're trying to do at Commissary Club. And I invite you from the deepest recesses of my heart and my team's heart to please come and join us. We need to look after each other. Like these incredible women have taken upon themselves to get involved with things in, the, in their efforts to help others who are going through it. We need to look after each other. We need to have each other's back because nobody else will do it unless we do it. So I'd like to thank everybody again for coming and joining us and hearing about these amazing, amazing women um, who are doing incredible things, who've been through hell and back and yet are better for it and stronger for it. And, you know, if you... Everybody needs to hear about them, you know, and if they do, you know, I think attitudes will change. So thanks so much. We'll be back here next week and you better be back here to join us. So thanks for joining us at the yard. We'll see you next time. Have a good night, everybody. Thank